Hello, good evening, everyone at home. Um, you're here with our Q&A. Um, we've just watched the film Sophia, and it's been completely amazing and very moving. moving. And I'm joined by Stacey, Rosie, Beverly, and Sue, and lots of lovely people in the audience. Um, we're celebrating Women's History Month, and this is one of the events we've been holding throughout the whole, that we've been holding um, during March. And um, we've been celebrating Women's History Month rather than just one day, we've been celebrating for the whole of March. And we've had various events. So we've had women's cycle rides, and we know the suffragettes used to love cycling, and Pippa's here and helped organize that. And we also have an art exhibition at the Lyric called Through Her Eyes of Female Artists from Hammersmith and Fulham. And tonight we've watched the film Sophia. And Beverly, who wrote and produced the film, is here to talk about that. Rosie, who um, is the co head of um, Wendell Park Primary School and has been doing some amazing work for our young students in the school as part of um, our women's trial trail that we're producing for next year and um, her children are going to be helping to produce that and Stacey who acted in the film and I think I've introduced to who was our um, deputy leader of the council and just amazing. So with that, I'm going to pass the mic over and let them do the Q&A and we can ask lots of questions. So thank you. Thank you. Is this on okay? Is it happy for sound? Do we need to pop that one on as well? Yeah, if you just press three. Then yeah. Can... I might just... Uh, well, that's a good sign. Uh, yeah, there we go. Okay. okay. Okay, can we do, can we leave them on that now, or is it, yeah. does it bother the sound too much? No, okay. Yeah. See what happens, they'll tell us again. <laughs> Welcome everyone, um, it's an absolute joy and a pleasure to be here with you. My name's Sue Fennimore, and some of you may have come across me, hopefully for good reasons rather than bad. Uh, I was deputy leader of Hamilton and Fulham until uh, 2023 when I took early retirement. Um, but I love this borough, and I'm biased, probably. Mm -hmm. But I do think what happens in Hammersmith and Fulham is exceptional and often radical. When we first uh, uh, took over in 2014, I said, uh, so, OK, what, what are we doing for Black History Month? And they looked at me mad and sort of said, what do you mean? And I said, well, you know, what are we doing? And clearly it was nothing. Same for Pride, had to actually go out and buy a rainbow flag. I was horrified that in 2014 we had nothing at all. And that set me on the path of celebrating women in the borough. And Councillor Rebecca Harvey, who's taken over from me, has just sent it off into the stratosphere. Thank you on behalf of everybody in Hamilton, women in Hamilton and Fulham, for really taking it on and, and really championing women's uh, equality in this borough and wider. But we've just been watching this amazing film, which um, I'm going to let Beverly tell us a bit about. I also want to talk to Rosie, because Rosie's an amazing woman, works down at Wendell School, and every International Women's Day does the most extraordinary events. And I was lucky to be part of that uh, about four years ago. For all these amazing women who've got amazing stories to tell with amazing careers, plumbers, electricians, politicians, um, got the opportunity to uh, come and talk to the children at Wendell School and then had a, another opportunity after to talk to them about, you know, um, inspiration about what uh, uh, young women uh, want to do and can succeed in. And that's not true of many yeah. generations. Yeah. So um, I'm going to welcome you all. Thank you so much for coming. And Beverly, I want to know mm -hmm. if it's all right. I'm yes. hoping that others will too. How on earth did you uncover this story? Mm -hmm. And also... You talked earlier, actually, you talked about not being the director. No. And I think lots of people feel that directing is the sort of pinnacle. But in my eyes, and I've had a bit of history of television, used to happen too. It's the producer that really does it. I mean, the, the people who actually get it going are the people that are absolutely extraordinary, not only to produce it, but to write it as well. Yes. I really want to know how this all came about. It started, there was... Um... In 2018, you know, it's the centenary of some women getting the right to vote. And a drum, yes, um, a drum school, um, Hughes Drum School and the Bishopgate Library came together 
and they um, developed this collaboration where they wanted to celebrate the lives of, I think it were eight women and we could choose. So they selected the writers. And my condition was it had to be a woman of color. And I couldn't think of, oh, Absolutely. you know, initially I thought of Claudia Jones who started the carnival, but they're saying there's some debate about that. It wasn't just one person. And then a friend of mine gave me the Anita Anand biography about Sophia. And I read this and I thought, oh my God, <laughs> why didn't I know about this woman Absolutely. before? And then I saw a documentary on her father and that started me on the journey. So we, I wrote it first as an audio play and it's still available on Spotify under Forgotten Women. And then pure coincidence, someone saw a message on Facebook saying, I just recorded this, it was great. And she was a professor at a university in Bhutan. And that university was celebrating their 10 year anniversary. And they asked to see the script. And they said, we want this to be the centerpiece of our 10 year anniversary celebration. Nice. And so I flew out to Bhutan and I saw it. And then when I came back, um, we, the actress who did the podcast said, we have to put this on. And so we applied to the Arts Council. And by the time we received the grant, mm, COVID hit. <laughs> so, Slight fly in the ointment. Yes. So very, very low. And we were thinking, oh, my God. And, then I, and it was a miracle we got the grant because it was just at the point where the Arts Council were moving all their funds to an emergency fund just for theaters. So even when I got the email, I didn't want to look at the email because I thought it was just going to be pressing news and then got a second email saying you didn't look at the email <laughs> <laughs> wonderful and you shot it in one day we shot it in one day we shot because we had one day to light and then one day to shoot it so taking out the the time for lunch and the time for breaks it was six hours and the last costumes where on earth did you find such okay. amazing costumes during lockdown when everything was shot exactly a poor custom designer, she's pulling out her hair. And literally, we got to just about the day before we were due to film. And I'm I'm a Buddhist and I swear by chanting. <laughs> and, I, and I went and I chanted in front of my columns. And it's like, we've got to find something because everything was shot. And then um I Googled, and I'm sure I'd Googled before, and I, nothing came up. And I Googled, and this custom year in Essex popped up who did period costumes and I thought where did that come from and then I emailed her thinking she'll never respond and she did the guys were answered clearly yes <laughs> absolutely <laughs> was absolutely it's an amazing film and about an amazing woman um at an amazing time in history and just if I may I share a little personal thing my <clears throat> great great grandfather was an MP during that time he was a Liberal MP, the same, mm. raw name. Which um, <clears throat> but what I'm always very intrigued by was his wife, mm. who was Margaret uh, Landell Sharp, who, uh, when you Google her, it just says, heavily involved in the suffrage movement. Mm. Now, heavily involved in the suffrage movement when you're the wife of MP is quite interesting. At that time when women's voices were not being heard. And I clearly think the heavily involved may have been a bit of a smoke and mirrors around suffragettes and suffrage movement. So who knows? So for me, I have to say it was hugely exciting and interesting. And I've got lots more research to do when I get home because I've known I've grown up with those stories. I've grown up with lots of stories about, you know, the times, of, you know, and also been a bit of a, a, a radical in my youth. <laughs> Probably not so much now but maybe it's still in there somewhere but that that whole time of fighting for rights yeah. and as you say you know women people talk about women getting voted in 1918 well they didn't they did. it was some women there was women over 30 who had property so basically it was it was wealthy women and it was a way of sort of divide and conquer it's like okay we'll give you a little bit and then hopefully you'll go away and and fortunately women didn't go away and they kept fighting and the culture at the time at that time as well. And you think about what Sophia did yeah. around that time, yeah. you know, it was, it was not a culturally 
you, I mean, some of the language, you know, that we heard in the film was very much reminiscent of how language would be then. Yeah. Yeah. So what an amazing woman to... Absolutely. And it was even, and I even wanted to show with one of the characters, Irene, who, who, who shall we say, doesn't you know, appear particularly well educated, even though she obviously comes from the emerging middle class. I want to just show how women were kind of, in a way, sort of like educated for leisure, in a way. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it was all very much, even when we listened, I, I was very uh, taken by the fact that one of the main uh, uh, women who was supporting the suffrage movement then talked endlessly about becoming a wife and marrying her husband as yeah. that was the pinnacle yes. of what women, yeah. women yeah. were yeah. allowed to do or had yeah. their aspiration yeah. to do was to get married. Yeah. And that's when it was interesting because Una then is the one who, who politi you know, kind of radicalizes Sophia. So she goes from saying, I want the perfect husband, I want the perfect kids, I want the perfect house, to like saying, no, 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 you know. And there are recordings of Una on YouTube that you can actually find now. Which is maybe if there's anything that you want to share, maybe we could pop that on the website so yeah. that anybody who hasn't had the opportunity or wants to know more about this story, yeah. maybe we could do that. That would be amazing. So, so, so talking about the play, so, so you, in one day, how do you manage to get such amazing cast members in such, <laughs> for such a short period of time? Well, one, of them is, one of them is here now, so she can speak. You know, she's the, one, the wonderful Vic, uh, Queen Victoria and Emmeline Pankhurst <laughs> as well. Absolutely amazing, yeah. Um, so I had previously worked with the director, Abby, and because of the time when we were filming it and rehearsing it, it was sort of May 2021. So we had, we'd come through full lockdown, but we were in roadmap territory of when, like how many people could be in a room together and what the rules were with regards to distancing. And um, it was still very much testing every day. And if anything, anybody had tested positive, it would have all been done sort of thing. So it was a case of sort of, how do we assemble a band of actors without the extra steps of the auditions, bringing everybody into a room sort of unnecessarily. So it was a case of who do we know who we think would fit these parts. And again, because there's a lot of what's called multi-rolling where you don't just play one, one character, who do we have that could cross all of those yeah. age boundaries and story boundaries and character styles? Um, so I was, obviously very available during <laughs> the old lockdown time. Many as well, apparently. Yeah, so thankfully got, got the call and we're in. But we sort of, we started on a Monday and we had Monday through Friday to sort of, that's a, I don't want to say pick apart because the writer's here, but sort of really sort of <laughs> yeah. go, into town, go to town with the script and think, right, what what is really essential in in terms of creating this short film, essentially. Um, what is getting in the way? What's muddy in the story? What's distracting us from what it is we want to say? And that, so that was Monday to Friday of week one. We then had Monday to Friday of week two. We did tech on the Saturday and filmed on the Sunday. So the whole thing was done within a fortnight. I mean, my part was done. Beverly's part was a lot longer than that. Um, but yeah, from sort of start of rehearsals through, it was like a fortnight. Amazing. Yeah. And it's an amazing story as well. So amazing achievement to get that up and running. And what's next? What's your... Oh, well, we're, we have been to a film festival in India, the Beta Sahib Palki Film Festival, which I've had work in before. And it's a premier independent film festival there. So amazing. it's going to be, hopefully, it'll get in and be screened there. And also... I'm currently the immersive artist in residence at um, Alboro. The Alboro Festival is the big uh, classical music festival center. Um, and they have a European wide program to make opera more diverse and more current. So um, I'm there hopefully causing havoc. Um, and Good. Good, I like it a lot. <laughs> and they, they're planning to screen in Alboro as well sometime this summer. Well, we wish you well with it because it's an amazing story and a, an amazing, uh, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. And I hope loads more people will get the chance to, to see what an amazing woman she was, really. Yeah. 
I mean, extraordinary and amazingly wonderful. I mean, I was really, I was really kind of annoyed when I saw Suffragette, which is a very good film, yeah. but but she's erased from it, and it it, it sends I think a, a kind of depressing message that women's rights were achieved by this group of white Which women white women yes, yeah absolutely and and you know everyone else in a way working class women yeah. uh, women of color everyone else is kind of sort of erased and even at the very end when they're listing when women um got the vote it's not kind of listed accurately so they'll have like 1918 and it's like well not really no. you know 1928 wasn't it yes, by the time yes yeah. you know and they don't list many african i don't think no. hardly any african countries any caribbean countries so it's this kind of very narrow focus and also the end of your film is a really poignant moment when actually uh and i've seen this before but i just think it tells a story mm -hmm. about when women actually got the vote yeah worldwide yes. i mean it, some of them are just absolutely staggering i know it was switzerland 1921 Switzerland in 1921. But even more so, I mean, you think about, you know, various other parts of well, the Saudi, world. Saudi Arabia, it was just like two years ago, you know. And then and then you look at Afghanistan, I think we listed it maybe three times, but they were, it could have been listed about four or five times who's going to get it. They got it at the same time, you know, they got the vote for all women mm -hmm. in Afghanistan in 1918. Then it's taken away. Then they get they, they got it back in sixty five. Then it was taken away. Then they get it back. And then now now it's taken away again. So it's a reminder that any right that's given can be a right that's taken. We've seen that across the world. I mean, we yeah, we have to look across it. You know, I know in America at the moment. Um, you know, you have, I mean, the horrendous stories that are coming out of Iran. And, you know, and that's you know, it's across the world. Women's women's. Uh, rights are seem to be being slowly eroded yeah. but Rosie that's I suppose what I want to talk to you about you work in the most amazingly wonderful school Wendell Park it is a truly wonderful inclusive school and the work that, that, that the whole team do at Wendell is quite phenomenal and I just I, I want to talk to you about your experience about working with young women children young women going through your schools of what, what, why is it so important that our story is heard not just by young women but by young men as well and tell us a bit more about what what set that path for you I mean I think for children it's, it's making sure that they um they've got that sense of belonging first of all and so at Wendell Park we've got a, a motto everyone equal everyone different everyone belong and I think with that starting point it's for the children to see themselves within the curriculum, to see themselves within the books that we read. Um, so meeting Beverly, we met um, at the unveiling of Fanny Eaton's track in um, in Hammersmith. And again, Fanny Eaton's another you know prominent mm -hmm. um, individual that we know very little about. Yeah. She yeah. is a, a, a mixed heritage model, pre-Raphaelite pre model, yeah. and. Um, so, you know, again, it's unveiling that and, and making sure that children know that history. Mm -hmm. So we met at that, yeah. spoke to Beverly, she talked about the film, asked me to come along to a, a, a private screening, saw the screening and said, oh my goodness, this has got to come to school. It would fit in so well with the national curriculum. Um, we learn about the suffragettes, but yeah. there's another layer. So what we're saying is you keep your history, but then you're impeeling the hidden history. So this is a way of bringing this into the fore. And um, and then we just decided to do a pilot with my year six students and the secondary school, um, which is Spring Cross Academy, with the assistant head there. Another amazing school, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Amazing, Fantastic. inclusive school. Mm -hmm. um, and I worked very closely with the assistant head there, um, uh, Shani. And, um, and so we did this pilot, and the students were just blown away by it, especially the secondary students who'd actually been studying mm -hmm. that. that um, aspect of the of, um, of history and they couldn't believe that why don't we know about a, an ancient suffragette does that really exist um so then we had a q a with beverly and we thought that worked really really well and then um last well this week on wednesday we had a bigger audience with around 100 students watching it and the q a again was amazing the children the students were the questions that they asked and just, it was just absolutely yeah. inspiring for yeah. us to see and um, and then of course we've got this up this evening, 
but I think for the children it's more it's getting them to see to be their authentic selves mm. and to feel that you know no matter where they're from they have a place here in Britain and when you start going through the history and all the way back you know even for myself I think it was only it was the, with the murder of George Floyd that Absolutely. I really started to get into history. I wasn't interested in history to be quite honest because I found it too painful to look at black history so I wasn't interested but when that happened I decided that gosh I really need to do something and, um, and my school my executive head at the time um, she she sort of said right what are we going to do and then we came up with the idea of having a four-hour in circle at the school and we just said we need to make sure that there's diversity and inclusion across the school within the curriculum within the experiences of staff pupils and um, and it, it just went from there really and this inclusivity has become pretty much embedded within the school oh, the main curriculum it's the main curriculum yeah. and it's not just it, it's the nine protected characteristics to the point where we did have a, um, a session um, that we were doing in PHLC and the person delivering the session came along and she had some images that were showing what was called puberty and um, that was like, you know, they, they showed the photos and they, they had the discussions and two students came running down to my office to say, this is no body diversity. It's all, <laughs> and I just thought, oh my goodness, <laughs> this is the you know, work. Year five. Yes. And I just thought, nice. wow, work is done. And I think it's, yeah. it's you know, when you, <laughs> when you have those, you know, children where it just becomes the norm and they will question, they become critical thinkers, they begin to question. And it's way overdue, absolutely, absolutely. way overdue. Yeah, absolutely. Certainly in this borough, um, the murder of George Floyd, is, as we all know, was a, was a catalyst mm -hmm. and, a, a, and an opportunity to try and make sure that the, the voices of women of colour, but everybody of colour who live in this an extraordinary borough, and it is an extraordinary borough, it's why I live here, because it is so multicultural, mm -hmm. And so wonderful. Those stories haven't been told before. And the opportunity now for those stories to come through. I mean, talking about the blue patch, there are many more to come from that. But that's been a hugely important thing that we now have the tour. And I know Captain Harvey, thankfully, is going to do a women's tour. This is all really important stuff. It's about a history, it's about belonging, it's about inclusion, it's about being part of the community. And it's so great to know that Wendell Park was doing such amazing, amazing work. I'm sure there are other schools too. I'll just cover myself then. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. But I'm particularly, particularly enamored with Fulham Cross and, and Wendell. So just probably just finishing up really now, but when we're talking about women's rights, particularly women of colour's rights across the world, I have a 26-year-old daughter who is feisty as anything with the police now, not that she got that from me, nothing to do with me, obviously. Um, in fact, she's way more feisty than I've ever been, which is quite extraordinary. What, what do you think for young women now, where we are in the world? Do you, I'm, I'm, I'm deeply worried and concerned that a lot of those important things that happen across the world for women that gave them equality are slowly being eroded. Uh, Beverly, what's your take on that? I mean, I'm an American, as you can hear from my accent, so I'm concerned. I mean, um, it feels like we're fighting the culture wars in America with very serious consequences there. When I look at local laws that are being passed, and of course, the overturning of the Wade, and at the moment, there is now um, a court case um, that seems to be going through the courts to challenge the, the accessibility of the abortion pill. And because yeah. they, they, that you actually have a judge um, deciding whether uh, the, bill, the pill is safe to go against the CDC's rec recommendation. The CDC is um, a medical um, body, a national medical body. So you, you actually have a judge who's going to decide whether or not this is safe. So that has never happened in the terrifying. country. And it's absolutely terrifying. It's completely terrifying. Choice as well. And, and having your, it's the same as eroding those rights around choice for women. It's, as has happened for many, many years, whether it be in careers, whether it be in medicals. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's 
it's a deeply worrying and, and what's what's what I find even what I just find absolutely infuriating is the people who are actually taking away this choice are of course men that's a very good point well yeah. made absolutely yet again we're going I don't think we're going full circle but I see I see I see, I see I'm hearing an alarm bell <laughs> that is what very I very good way to put it very good Thank you all. I think probably. Yeah, but so, so thank you. So that's enough waffling for me. Um, I'm sure there are questions. It was just a wonderful film. Thank you so much. Brilliantly written. It was just wonderful. And your acting was wonderful as well. I have I, actually maybe a couple of questions. The first one was. Why why did Emmeline Pankhurst have a Mancunian accent? Because I thought she was a Londoner. She lived in Notting Hill, no? We were really so so we didn't think she she may have lived there, but we didn't think that was where where her background was. Mm. It was also a we went down a couple of sort of local colloquial choices in order to just make it very much not the RP that we had with the girls who were to support and the Queen Victoria and mm. all of that just to make them stand out a bit more. London we looked at and it we we couldn't find any recordings of her, so we couldn't pick her out. But she did it. I think her family is her family home not up in Notting Hill. Unsure. Unsure. Okay, okay that's yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I can show I that. think I can show you where it is. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's fine. Um, well, it was wonderful. Thank you. I mean, your diverse, your diversity, your elasticity. I mean, it was just great. All of the characters you played, you did brilliantly. Um, the the other question I had was kind of it's sort of about going back full circle, and all of the stuff that we're dealing with at the moment. How current do you feel that Sophia's story is? I think very current. You know, I think, and it was interesting because it was something that one of the kids, we had a school's uh, screening on Wednesday with both in the Clark and Fulham Academy. And um, one of, for the Q&A there, one of the students, a girl asked me, what was it I would like them to take away? And I felt the most important thing to take away is that one, one woman can make a difference. I think that there's so much pushing us toward apathy right now that, well, what's the point? You know, I can't change anything. Politics sucks, so why should I vote? And, you know, and I really wanted to, to inspire, you know, particularly women and particularly young women that you can make a difference. You can make a difference, you know, so you have to move past that, you know. And if you do, um, slip into apathy it only takes a section of a population to do that before you end up with tyrannical governments you know that they they're, they're there they're ready to take advantage uh, on that apparently it's three and a half percent is the tipping point so you know within kind of the climate movement of which i i i'm very involved Really, what we need is three and a half percent of the population saying we need change, yeah. and that is the tipping point. So, really interesting to hear you talk about apathy. Thank you. Any more questions? Are there any other questions anywhere? Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I was just going to mention, oh, this is really loud, isn't it? Um, uh, in this borough is Shepherd's Bush, good borough, which everyone might know, and that was the first Sikh temple in Europe, and it's got a lot of Sikh ties with the British, and was given, the land was given by a Punjabi prince, basically, and Sophia, actually, that was her congregation. Oh, wow. 
So, it's so it's if you're looking for somewhere to show it, I was actually just texting one of the committee guys because he's a good mate of mine. Uh, mm -hmm. And I've got, you can, well, more than welcome to take a number in his email, but that might be a cool place to show this. I would love to. Uh, would and I think her death anniversary, we normally do that as he is like on the 13th of August. I don't know if that might be a good date or that was no, that around that time. It'd be great. Let's um, them. And they're quite forward thinking. They recently showed a film, had a QA and stuff like that upstairs. Um, and there's obviously nothing extra in the film, whatever, so it'd be fine to show in the Sikh temple. So I think that might be a good shout to get it out there. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the, to show it or something like that would be pretty cool. Because we felt, because it was shown, the, the very first place it was shown was by the Indian High Commission at the Naval Center. And maybe about a third of the audience was Sikh, yeah. you know, then. And literally people were crying because they were saying mm -hmm. how rare yeah. the Sikh community is kind of acknowledged sometimes in the media. And that, you know, I thought it was really It'd be really great as well. So I'll put my ex counselor hat on and take it off straight away in a minute. Because maybe Emma can put you in touch with the team that are working around all these stories that we're not. Yeah, yeah. Not well, it's not for a team, actually. More than welcome to yeah. get into contact and, and he'll be up for it. Um, and I mean, Shepherds has been on the BBC a lot and stuff like that. So yeah. a lot of people know about it. So it might be a good place to. Yeah, share definitely. It. Let's exchange numbers. Definitely. Yeah, you're more than welcome to take it. He said, I text him like, that's all good. So you're all good. <laughs> So I'll be a bit of while I'm sitting. Yeah. Great. That'd be amazing. Yes. Do we have any more questions? Go on, Rebecca, you do some. Yeah. yeah. So when I was watching it, what really um, struck me was the part where um, they were talking about the 18th of November mm -hmm. and um, the police brutality. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, sort of the sexual assaults that were occurring. Two women died after, you know. Yeah, I didn't even know about that. Um, in fact, I didn't really know an awful lot at all. And that really just struck me at the current place we are, you know, the Casey report yeah. and yeah. Me Too and, yeah. and what happened with Sarah Everard. And yeah. and it's just astonishing that so many, so many decades later we're still we're dealing still, with the same problems. Yeah. yeah. And do you know who the Home Secretary was at the time? Who actually ordered, who ordered this? Yes, uh, yes, Winston Churchill, you know. And so this, that, that is what Sophia says, that level of violence would not have happened without it being sanctioned, you know, by the very top. And so, yet it was the women who got arrested. Yeah. Just for having an opinion or a voice or yeah. threatening whatever yeah. they do, yeah. did. With no violence, they were simply walking. Yeah, yeah, same they were simply walking. Yeah, yeah. same with the Sarah Everard vigil. Mm -hmm. It just mm -hmm. happens to exist in that space on that yeah. night, yeah. and that was enough. Yeah. How dare you? Yeah, yeah. 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 Grim, grim is the right word, I think, yeah. but um, it, it's just astounding that here we are with history almost repeating itself, but in a different type of context. Yeah. And it, it also sort of reminds me, or makes me think about the abuse online, because now as, as sort of online, everyone has access to Twitter and what have you. And, you know, that is carrying on the, yes. the abuse that's happening. And they're, and they're it, saying that, you know, female politicians, particularly female politicians in Iraq, the scale of abuse that they get, it's just absolutely horrific. You know, the, I mean, I follow on Nicholas Virgin, and she was beautiful message saying, I've done my best, and now I'm stepping down. And just reading the message after, I like, I hope you die, or rape threats, or, you know, and, and you're thinking, why would you sit down and type this? Because it's, it's still such an instantly accessible power play mm -hmm. for men to put that onto a woman. There's a really Rate is maybe the word. Emily A. Tass's documentary that's out. And yeah, it's really like good. BBC, BBC. Channel Four, I think it is. Yeah, and it's about how um, she, if you don't know who she is, she was the the, the female actress who was who was made sort of quite famous in the in between us. But she was a very beautiful blonde girl who was then made to be that typical blonde um, sexy character in that film. And what followed then was that was all she was seen as. Um, in order for her career to, to sort of stay a light, I suppose is the word, she was 
offered certain contracts and certain photo shoots and things like that. And then what she ended up becoming was a an inadvertent uh, glamour model. Nothing that she was ever ashamed of, but things that she was proud of. She enjoyed using her body in that way. But what she found during lockdown in particular, when everybody was at home and stuck behind their computers with instant access and nowhere to go, is that the level of sexual aggression she got online was just next level. Mm. Um, and there's this documentary that followed her and it's post lockdown, obviously, it follows what she would deal with and how her family didn't know. And she started to get in touch with the people who were messaging her. And they were all ridiculous handles that had been invented. But um, some of them would just instantly shut down the account as soon as they mm -hmm. received a message from her. Some of them would reply and get worse. Um, but it's an instant power play because there's there's no you can't escape it. She she doesn't want to shut her social media down, but that's the only way. And why should she it. have to? Yeah. 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 That's the optimist. Yeah. Yeah. Because what she comes up against is everybody says, Well, you brought it on yourself. How can you possibly so bring, bring that, that on yourself? Yeah. That is not that's a normal scale. response yeah. to posting a picture of yourself on holiday in a bikini, in a dress, whatever it is. That is not so she's a perfectly response. entitled. Yeah, do, you know, she's speaking for she wants. No, and, and you know, recently as well in the States, um, is been happening in terms of casting for some of the fantasy epics. For instance, the House of the Dragons, the, the sequel to Game of Thrones, that they have chosen to make one of the families um, black. And all of a sudden, you have this, this you know, these trolls okay. saying, yeah. how, yeah. how dare you in this fantasy world have these black actors? It's not realistic. And it's like, well, hello, neither are dragons. You know, it's <laughs> like, it's like, you know, it, it, it's just bizarre. It's a cesspit of hate, isn't it? It's absolutely bizarre. Yeah. There's a huge, there's a huge responsibility on what responses have been normalized by the media. Totally true. Left, right, and center. And you see it now with um, whatever your thoughts on the situation are with Harry and Meghan. Everything that has come with regard yeah. to that situation, yeah. which is part of our business, is has all been fueled by media responses yeah. in whatever direction. Yeah. Yeah. If they've yeah. agreed with it, then people agree with it. If they disagree with it, people will disagree with it. What whoever's voice is the loudest, and the media has such a responsibility mm -hmm. and it is yeah. taking the responsibility. And I think I think people, you know, again, however you feel on that, you know, pro or against. They're people, I and somehow they're human beings, and somehow that ends up being forgotten. And the next level of that is people like Andrew Tate and himself. Yes. Which, which yes. you know, it's again, is an horrendous yeah. attitude towards women. That, that actually, again, well, Rosie, you, you, I'd love to know what your thoughts yeah. are on that, because going to, you know, with Absolutely. kids. And I think, you know, for our youngsters, it's been able to unpick that. We yeah. talk a lot about um, allyship. So within schools, especially secondary schools, it's having your male teachers standing up there and really advocating what it is to be, what it is to be a strong male, what it is to have empathy, what it is to um, treat people with respect, women, your, your peers with respect. I think, I think it comes down to that, and it's the education. And it, again, it's this whole thing of having students or children that, from a very early age are able to think critically to question and, and I think it starts with that, that again strong sense of who they are and strong mm -hmm. sense of you know respecting themselves and and knowing that they have a right they have a voice and once they've got that instilled then it's you know whatever they come up against they will know well actually that is very you know it's very negative it's it's not going to, you know, it's not going to affect me. It's not going to be normalised and giving them a voice to, to call these things out. But it's mm -hmm. really, it, you are, it's a battle mm -hmm. because it can be so strong. I mean, Andrew Tate, I mean, goodness me, the followers that he has mm -hmm. and, and you're okay. pressing, you know, young minds mm -hmm. and that's what it is. And it's so attractive yes. to see some of the things that, that he's, you know, portraying and, you know, for youngsters, young males, they probably think, oh, Really like that, but you know, and they're really listening. Yeah, but, but particularly again, after lockdown. After lockdown, yeah. yeah, absolutely. But I think if you've got strong role, um, male role models that can 
start to work with each other and work with the, the boys and also the girls as well understanding yeah. what's right and what's not right yeah. you know, and they can so and they have boys and having to say up. absolutely absolutely you are Education. always doing what you feel like it's just whether or not you have the belief in your gut feeling for it that's where it's like for me I don't actually know why I feel uneasy about yeah. what you've just said but what if what you've just said does not make me feel good and, yeah. that's and learning how to challenge that in a respectful way yeah. but in a with the with the language that is clear and you don't you're not feeling under attack yeah. it's so important isn't it those messages or that burning I think religion. particularly as creatives you know that we feel a huge huge sense of responsibility about what we can put out there about the stories we tell because there are things that will resonate particularly with with children it'll resonate with them for years and years and years yeah. to come language is so absolutely important absolutely and that, i think that's such a really important point that you just said um because when you think back before women had a vote where where did it come how did people decide that women should just be at home cooking cleaning having children you know where did the sense because i read somewhere that actually it wasn't like that back in like no, 1200 no, or something no. like that it was very very different no yeah a friend of mine who's a historian she explained that when we were a hunter-gatherer society women were quite respected they had um they had powerful roles within the communities you know, within tribal communities. It's only when um, we ended up being dwellers, being farmers, owning homes, then there was the idea of, well, we have property, men, you know, men want to actually be able to give their property on to their children. They need to know who is the father of these children. Women then became seen as property. So it was, it, it was relatively recent. And I think that also links to when you look at the transatlantic um, slave trade. Oh, yeah. so, absolutely. You know, so before that, um, you know, black community were, you know, had rights. Um, yeah. We're in Britain quite freely and so on. Um, but then when it became a whole thing of becoming a commodity and, um, you know, the wealth that was brought from that, and it became, you know, it, it they had to become dehumanized, dehumanized, dehumanized yeah. yeah. in order for them to be able to do and that they, and, and to use them as a commodity um, to, you know, the plantations and so on. And that's how it came back. So, and you, when you're looking at resources and looking at wealth and money, that's how that change yeah. took place. And also, you're saying that I mean, awfully. I mean, you look at the statistics um, around modern slavery. Mine. I mean, it is. is shockingly terrifying how many young women, particularly who were being coerced into sex trafficking, mm. but also just women across London who are, you know, used as slaves, mm. to be mm. frank. I mean, it's appalling. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think not I here, think, though. They do amazing stuff. Though. I think I think that, you know, resonate a really important point. I read a play that was just looking at um, migration, immigration, but it's in, set in two different um, centuries, so now. But in the 17th century to 1600s, where there is um, a, a recorded uh, letter or something where King James welcomed an African noblewoman from West Africa to court and just remarks that she's the most beautiful woman in the land. This predates slavery. So it just shows that People are conditioned to think in a certain way, you know, and well, they must always challenge it. Yeah, absolutely. Always, always. absolutely. Yeah. 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 If anyone else has got questions, then maybe we can, if not, we can. Um, so looking at what's happening now with being able to vote, there's so much actually people don't vote, yeah. but also this government have just made it 10 million times harder for people to vote who come from poorer working class backgrounds, different ethnicities and women. Um, so how how do you think, like learning from, from history and, and your research, we can challenge? I think it's, it's, I mean, because I actually think change comes from local communities. I don't think change comes from the top down. I think it comes from the bottom up. 
So I actually think it's like galvanizing people within your communities. And, and that's something I'm really proud of that's happened in the States where, again, you're getting all sorts of local, you know, because all of a sudden people really are voting because they'll say, well, we may not necessarily agree with everything that, you know, um, Biden does, but we look at the alternative and we're absolutely horrified. So you actually, you had in Georgia, they actually passed laws that said that you weren't supposed to be sharing cars to actually come to a voting station. So, you know, if you actually, if you have grandparents who, who are struggling with something, then how are they expected to get there? That you're not supposed to be handing out bottles of water at polling stations where people are queuing in, in the heat. Yeah, in the heat. So, but they were finding ways around it. So if you weren't supposed to be handing out bottles of water at the station, they'd be across the street. <laughs> Here are the bottles of water, you know, just come and we'll hold your place for you and things. So I that and that was just community activism. All politics is local. Yeah. It is. It is. Yeah. All politics are local. It is. Absolutely. You know. And it should go without saying, but I'm going to say anyway. It's all deliberate. It is deliberately now difficult yeah. for everybody to vote. For. Similar as when women were given the right to vote, but it was only wealthy, wealthy, which, wealthy be, which yeah. essentially mm -hmm. there's arguments as to what that means with with regards to the setup of that of those marriages at that mm -hmm. time. Yeah. Women were still very much their husband's wife, therefore their vote was their husband's premium. So yes they were given the vote, but they were just the second husband to be able to vote. And that, that it's all, it's deliberate. There's, and in terms of sort of seeing the red flags and challenging it, it's it's like when you read it, when you read a newspaper report and you can see the same story in four different newspapers mm -hmm. and you will come away from that story with a different opinion depending on the bias, which shouldn't exist, but it does, mm -hmm. of the writer. And that, that's what needs yeah. to be challenged. We need to see that and go, what do you mean you've got to have people mm -hmm. which I don't know at the vote? I exist as a, I have a right in this country to vote. That should be the end of it. But it, that's, that, at that stage, it needs to be questioned and it needs to be strongly questioned. And also look for your, look for your heroines as well. Be inspired by them. Your heroines. Be inspired by them. You know, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Barbara Castle. You know, that I just think, you know, when I, when I heard when she brought, she was um, the minister for transport, and I think she brought in the speeding limits and the battle for her to be able to do that. You know, men were saying, well, you're a woman, you know nothing about driving. And it's like, <laughs> how does that make any sense? <laughs> Where does that argument? And, and I'm showing my age, but that wasn't that long ago. That was the 70s. And and they were saying, literally, as soon as they brought in that limit, the, the uh, fatalities, motor fatalities dropped substantially. You know, but she fought through in the Dagnum, the Ford plant, when I was yeah, reading Dagnum. about that. That's a, great, that's a great film as well, actually. I haven't yeah. seen no, it. No, it's really great. I think it... Yeah, it's yeah. absolutely fantastic. Yeah. And the, she's, she's just... She just, if you're looking for a politician who made a difference, look no further than Barbara Castle. She definitely made a difference. Mm -hmm. Female politicians. <laughs> <laughs> just not, well, well, yeah. Uh, yeah. Good yeah. ones, good <laughs> ones. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's only that. <laughs> I can think of two women yeah. actually who come I to mind. I can think of several currently in, in the government. But <laughs> oh, oh, oh yes, yes. Well, there's probably a lot more worse <laughs> yeah. men than the women. Yeah. Let's, yeah. let's say that. Yeah. Um, yeah. What next for the film? Uh, what I'm saying is hopefully going to India and then we're going to show it in Alboro and, and it seems like we'll be showing it again in the borough here as well and we're just looking for other opportunities um you know it'd be great if we can get more cinemas to screen it you know as well so good um, luck honestly it's so such an amazing film with an amazing story i really really enjoyed it thank, thank you. you story will be out about the day fascinating <laughs> thank story thank you thank you, thank you so much